Today is Thursday, November 17, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Irving Goldstein. Welcome, Irving. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? December 19, 1920. Where were you born? Worcester, Massachusetts. And your current address is in Sudbury? Right. Your marital status? Married. And how many children? Well, really between us is second marriage. Between us, there are five children. Any grandchildren? Yes. And how many of those? Oh, let's see, one, two, three, five. Good for you. And tell us a little bit about what Worcester was like when you were growing up. Well, it was an interesting place because um, there were um, ethnic groups. I lived on uh, being brought up on what was called the east side mm -hmm. of Worcester and uh, went to school in a place called Grafton Street School. It's still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really a, a very uh, working neighborhood. But, uh, and the Jewish population, quite a bit of the Jewish population was in that particular area mm -hmm. uh, where, where we lived. And uh, in time, there was movement. Mm -hmm. And when I, we moved from one section, uh, which was Barclay Street, and I went to Grafton Street Junior High, and then we moved to Providence Street, and I went to a, another junior high, and uh, where we lived that, at that particular time, it was a lot of wooded area, mm -hmm. and it was very different than where I previously lived. So I was able to get into the woods and so forth. And also, basically, there was a, like a pond where I learned to skate, mm -hmm. and there were tennis courts where I learned to play tennis, which I played most of my life, having started there, uh -huh. probably at the age of 12. Okay. And where'd you go to high school? Uh, I went to classical high school. It was um, preparation for for going to college. Uh, you were telling us you were we, you went to classical high school, preparation for college. And where did you go to college? Well, inter no, interestingly okay. enough, mm -hmm. that um, I could not afford college. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm the only one in the family of, uh, I had two sisters and a brother. I was the youngest. And basically, uh, my parents said that if you want to go to college, you've got to go to work. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated high school, it was a couple of years I worked. And, and where did you work? Well, interesting. <laughs> I worked for a firm that was handling war surplus of World War I. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> now, the, the gentleman that was the manager of the, of the uh, um, firm mm -hmm. was an ex-professor from, uh, in mathematics, from Clark University, mm -hmm. who was let go because he was a red. He, he was a... He was, he was a communist. <laughs> he was of that bent. Oh, boy. And he would be hiring young people who were on their way to, to working to go to college. Now, at that particular time, <laughs> there was a gentleman who uh, was working there who were a graduate of Clark University in physics and could not find, this is now, this is now uh, the late 30s, couldn't find work. And he was also a shipping clerk. And <laughs> there was another 
another fellow who was fine arts graduate who they couldn't find work, so they were shipping clerks, so we were shipping clerks. And so basically, so I had people I was working with who were interesting because there were interesting conversations. And I said, you know, I, I was interested in, in um, you know, in, in technical, technical things and uh, in things engineering. And they said, well, um, you know, maybe we can teach you uh, mathematics or something if you wanted that. And they, um, they told me about a particular book, recommended a book. I got the book and began studying it. And the gentleman who was the professor at lunch would be, he would be uh, teaching me or going over things and mm -hmm. so forth. So in the two years, I, I was able to uh, pick up a, a lot of information. And then uh, I got a, a scholarship to Worcester Poly. And so I went there. Okay, so now you've got a scholarship, the WPI. Yeah, yeah, a scholarship there. And basically, uh, it was interesting because I, I uh, was thinking of chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I took courses, and I said that, gee, chemistry requires a lot of memory. And yeah, it was a lot of work. The grades are pretty good. I said, I have to work too hard at this. I've got to do something that <laughs> comes easier. And so I, I then decided on electrical engineering. And um, I found that um, having gone through this book on math, mm -hmm. I was able to whistle through the, the math courses with grades like total grades of 98 or whatever. I mean, it was, it was a piece of cake. I mean, that power is a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. I had to work at some of the other things. And, um, being a little older, though, now I picked up that two years, then uh, the war mm -hmm. was going on, was starting, and uh, it became interesting because WPI was under the V-12 Navy program. Unfortunately, I was two years too old for it because of the time that I mm -hmm. used working and the only option offered was an army option mm -hmm. in terms of a deferment. And so I took that. And uh, then the second half sophomore, they said, we're taking you. OK. Let's backtrack a little bit to December 1941, shortly before your 21st birthday, uh, Pearl Harbor. Do you remember uh, where you were? Yes. When, tell us about. Well, I was with a couple of friends. I think we saw The Wizard of Oz. Okay. Uh -huh. And when I was leaving the theater, I heard the news. So I, I, I associate that with the, with, with, the, with, the, with the movie. Wow. Okay, so now that you're second semester sophomore and the Army has decided to take you, this is now 1942? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's all, 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 right. all in there. Okay, so the Army is taking yeah, you. Yeah, and then uh, they said, okay, uh, I got basic training at Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. Now, did any of your family or friends uh, join you when you... No. No? Okay. No. And tell us what basic training was like in Atlantic well, City. Well, basic training... <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Not having been away from home, mm -hmm. uh, it was really a hell of an adjustment for me in, in terms of getting used to the, the food, the routines, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly where they would march us, and a lot of it were these drill sergeants, that, they would march us on a beach and sometimes into the water. Oh, yeah, mm. oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Anything else about basic? Uh, well, I mean, we went through the uh, the marches, and 
then uh, the interesting thing was I discovered that there were different three different courses mm -hmm. open and different choices. And one of the choices was the Army Specialized Training Program, mm -hmm. which uh, if you qualified for it, you could get into it. And it, it was in different technical areas. Mm -hmm. And so I really enrolled and uh, got accepted. And that was a, an interesting process because after the training, they sent me a couple of places. What was University of Buffalo, which was a, like pre-screening uh, testing. And then the real, real tests came in uh, Iowa, in uh, Grinnell, Iowa, mm -hmm. where they really uh, ran through a whole series of uh, academic tests, mental tests, whatever, for you getting into the program and decided, well, okay, uh, you really were a second half sophomore, you really know what it is, so we'll continue the education. And so that they said, okay, uh, you're going to go to Brooklyn Polytech and take electrical engineering. And so I said, well, the move is pretty good because it's continuous in mm -hmm. terms of what I was doing. So I went there and it was actually, um, we lived in a Fort Greene housing project which had just been developed. It was never used. And it was in a kind of a rough area of Brooklyn. And we would uh, march from that housing project to Borough Hall where the uh, school was. Mm -hmm. It's a school without a campus because it's... Right. Mm -hmm. And really, it was, they're really tough courses. They really, really pushed us. And it turns out that um, some of these courses were like graduate courses and compared with what I had before. And I, I managed, mm -hmm. uh, and I was there for a period of time. It's, it's, it's really in the, I don't remember the exact mm -hmm. length of time, but it's in yeah. the uh, the write-up I have there. Uh -huh. It might have been eight months, uh, something like that. Uh -huh. And then uh, they said, well, the program is dissolved. Uh, we had two groups of people. Uh, one was electrical engineering, and the other was mechanical engineering. And I said, well, the electrical engineering people are going to the Signal Corps. And that's in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. But the uh, mechanical engineers are going to the infantry over to France. Mm -hmm. So they, <laughs> it was really a matter of luck in terms of what group you happen to be in. And you happen to be the one that ended up in Jersey. That's right. Okay. So in Jersey, they said, okay, you guys, uh, we're going to teach you, uh, we're going to teach you in certain kinds of communications. It's point to point communications. Uh, we use ultra high frequencies. Currently, we use microwaves for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you'll be working on um, aspects of what's called carrier and repeater. It's particular equipment where there are multiple frequencies mm -hmm. and you separate out the signals. Uh, it's now s stuff we all use in our FIOS and all the different wavelengths and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of equipment. So we're trained in that and then they said, okay, you're going to be a group of 12 and you, you 12 are going to work together. Some of you people are going to work on the, the uh, the UHA link and other people works on the telephone part of it, but you're a group. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we then went into the field and uh, worked in the field for a while just to get practice. Then we got orders and we ended up in California on a ship. Uh, let's see if I remember the name of the ship. Oh I believe you said it was the General Sturgis? No, no, no. Nope. General Sturgis is a separate ship. Okay. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. that, now you're jumping ahead. All right. Um, mm -hmm. No. 
Uh, oh, the SS Lure Line, S L U R L I N E. I Googled some of these ships. Oh, okay. And, oh, yeah, they're, 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 I Googled, mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, I, I Googled the surges. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so we sailed, and we sailed really without any kind of escorts, zigzag across mm -hmm. the Pacific to, uh, we stopped it at uh, New Caledonia, mm -hmm. short stop, and then ended up in Hollandia, Dutch New Guinea. And in that harbor were ships as far as you could see. They were preparing for the invasion of the mm -hmm. Philippines. And then we set up a group that was on a hill overlooking the harbor, and our equipment, um, that's where we camped, but our equipment was down in the valley, and it was very close to the headquarters mm -hmm. of, of MacArthur's, mm -hmm. MacArthur's area there. And all the information would be going from the headquarters through our equipment out to wherever it had to go okay. in terms of the... Mm -hmm. I understand that you didn't personally m meet MacArthur, but you know about the office. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the office, the, the office comes later. Okay. The office comes in Japan. All right. When, mm -hmm. the, there I was not, I was doing my duty. Mm -hmm. that, it was only after surrender mm -hmm. that they connected us to the Daiichi building, which where he, ah, okay. he we're sort of jumping ahead. All right, so we'll, let's just jump back to the Philippines then. Yeah, well, we're in the Philippines. <laughs> okay. Which I interesting things happen in the Philippines. Okay. In terms of that, um, as far as the enemy was concerned, uh, there was kind of uh, it was on the outskirts of the base. Occasionally, there were stragglers because what MacArthur had done, he jumped up the coast and bypassed mm -hmm. a number of them, and so they were starved out. Except for an island, I don't know how far off Philadelphia was, but occasionally planes would come by and there would be munitions dropped and so forth, but nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, I remember uh, it, it, we were, uh, our camp was up on the hill overlooking the harbor. It was a huge explosion. And what it was apparently, there's a, 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 a Japanese uh, mini sub that had hit, hit sort of an anchor chain or something. So that, that there was a, huge explosion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, the interesting thing was they were, at night, no, nothing, was, nothing was blacked out. It was, they, were, they, were, they were really meaning business and loading stuff. And one very memorable thing, uh, I don't know how, it was a scary, one of the scariest things I think that I experienced, uh, that is the night I think it was very close to the night before the invasion. We monitored work, stuff coming through our link, mm -hmm. and officers were told that this was not a secure link because it would go on the telephone to radio mm -hmm. and be picked up by another radio system. It was really a link. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who it was, but someone got on and talked about the time and place of the invasion. This went on, and there were three of us, we turned white. I mean, I don't know what ever happened and so forth, but we, we <laughs> experienced something. And the next morning, the ships were gone. Uh -huh. I mean, this place was, was cleared out. It didn't take very long. In, in terms of the, uh, that aspect of it. And that's something I never forgot, mm. having, having that experience and realize possibly so many lives are mm. in, in possibly in jeopardy in mm -hmm. terms of what happened. And I, I, who knows, anyway. Then we were there for I don't know how long, maybe three or four months. Uh, might have been a little longer. And then the, the 12 of us uh, were shipped to the Philippines, north of Manila. 
And uh, there were kind of rumors at that time that the war was something was going to something big was going to happen, and uh, I guess something big did happen within a uh, number of weeks afterward. So the twelve of us got orders that we would we were north of Manila mm -hmm. to, to go to Manila and get on a particular ship, which was the SS Sturgis, and we didn't know where, when, and how, where, where we were going to go. So we end up on Sturgis, and it is a troop ship. Mm -hmm. Basically, there were 12 of us, there was a crew, and then apparently there were 17 high-ranking officers. Uh, uh, the names, uh, some very, very well-known officers. Uh, and uh, this comes afterward in terms of Googling and finding out mm -hmm. what, was, what else was on that ship. On that ship were, MacArthur had a group around him mm -hmm. he called his personal gods, okay? Right. These are people he really trusted in terms of it. Now, what happened before we sailed, by, by a week, two envoys from Japan were secretly sent to Manila to negotiate the surrender with MacArthur and his staff. Uh -huh. These two Japanese were also on the ship. We didn't see them. They were not, but they were on the ship and the, the gods, the, the, the god group that MacArthur had, mm -hmm. be sure that they were under control or okay. whatever. Now all this is happening around what time? Late forty-four or so? Forty-five. No, forty-five. And forty-five. The dates are uh, uh, okay. The dates are in there. Okay. Yeah, it just it just before the surrender. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh, the, the, the surrender see. dates uh, here, here. Yeah, here here is oh, okay. the, the General Sturgis mm -hmm. and the surrender dates, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now. So what happened was, uh, well, we had been on one troop ship when we sailed across the Pacific, and this was a nice one because we all had rooms <laughs> in, 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 mm -hmm. in terms of what it was. So after, I don't know how long it took, maybe about six, five or six days, mm -hmm. we ended up in Tokyo Bay okay. where to the horizon there were ships. And our ship was docked next to the Missouri. Wow. Because these 12, these 17 gentlemen, a lot of generals and, and, and whatever, were part of the surrender ceremony. And there was one Canadian colonel I learned who was one of the signatures he signed. He was one of the signatures of the... Uh, of, of the treaty. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I learned this again from the, I mean, I lived through it, but I didn't know what was going on mm -hmm. till, I, till I got out of the computer and started, once, once you got, mm -hmm. once you got me interested. So when you, uh, you're on the troop ship next to the Missouri, did you see any of this happening? Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I was a stone's throw from it. I mean, they were, they were, I mean, it was like from here to, uh, right, I'm, I'm trying to get an idea, maybe 25 feet away. I mean, we, we, were, wow. we were right there and saw, saw the whole thing. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah, and, and the gentleman had a cane, and he, one of them, had, he came in a top hat. I realized that he was a foreign minister. Mm -hmm. He was a foreign minister there, and then there was a general, and they signed. Now, the interesting sidelight I picked up on Google, mm -hmm. that uh, there, was a, there was a member of the crew uh, who, who was a, 
in, in one of the veterans organizations who was, in, who was also part of the crew, mm -hmm. Navy crew of the Sturgis, yeah. who said that he was aware of all the, the generals who were aboard and <laughs> that he said there was a joke because the colonel, the Canadian colonel, uh, who signed the the the, uh, the treaty signed on the wrong line. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> that that was kind of a joke that the uh -huh. the, 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 the the Navy crew had in terms in terms of it, in terms of doing it. But but anyway, uh, it was an interesting bit, and I uh, then checked on a number of ships that were there. And I counted, uh, just, just on, from getting information from the computer, there were about 400, let's see, no, 271 Some, ships. Mm -hmm. And we were the uh, ones that were the, the closest mm -hmm. in terms of doing it. And then in Japan, the duty was interesting because where we were doing communications point to point, we got involved with communications, um, long distance communications mm -hmm. between the U.S., between uh, Japan and the U.S., mm -hmm. high power transmitters. But uh, we were still connected with MacArthur, with his group, and that I had telephone work to do, and uh, it was in his office mm -hmm. in the Daiichi building. No. And I used to spend time in the Daiichi building, in his office. He wasn't there, but his pipes and, and his stuff was there, mm -hmm. and so forth. And he was uh, quite neat. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he was not a uh, he was not a sloppy yeah. person at all. Can you tell us a little more about the group of twelve that you worked well, with? Well, it's interesting. Yeah, the group of twelve consisted of uh, really, they were engineering students mm -hmm. and uh, very bright guys from different roles in life. Some, uh, one will realize, came from an extremely wealthy family, mm -hmm. uh, really very, very much so, mm -hmm. and others were um, average guys. Uh, and they were, they were uh, quite stimulating in terms mm -hmm. of the conversation and so forth. Now, the, the officer who was in charge of us uh -huh. in, in New Guinea, he, 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 we lost him after we went to, uh, we separated when we went to uh, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have, that we, it was interesting because we, really, we were on our own almost there. I don't remember any any officers, but he was in the reserve, and he, in, in his um, civilian life, ran a gas station. So <laughs> there was little, little <laughs> um, technical talk between the two of us. Right. Be between us, there was a, quite a gap in terms uh -huh. of, I mean, he, he was in charge of the, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the, uh, of us, but mm -hmm. really what we're doing, he was not very aware of, right. uh, technically. So. so when you said you lost, you, you, did, you, didn't, you didn't die or anything? Was oh, just, no, no, oh, no, no, okay. we just, we went separate ways. I don't okay. know what happened to him, actually. All right. So now, he, he was oops, a, go he was a, Well, you know, it was interesting. He, we had uh, separate tents. I mean, we had a huge tent where we lived in, and he had his own quarters. Mm -hmm. Tents, and uh, basically, uh, we had telephones. We communicate, and we began to realize that this guy's listening to our, listening to our conversations. And I said, the "Heck with that!" And I would be the guy who cut the line. And, and then basically, uh, no one, no one talked about it. So, mm -hmm. but he began to realize somebody was doing it, and he figured it was me. Oh dear! And, and he called me in, and he said, "You know." Uh, I, I didn't own up to it in, in terms of what it was. Mm -hmm. it, it, he didn't push me too hard. Then he says, you know, you have initiative. Don't you want to become an officer? 
and so forth. You have independence and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I said, no. <laughs> well, what was said, your rank at the time? Uh, well, it was a, a Tech 3, which tech is a three. staff mm -hmm. sergeant, a technical staff sergeant. Mm -hmm. And but you didn't want to become no, an officer. No, the, well, the military didn't interest me in terms of the, the structure. Mm -hmm. Some people liked the structure. I, I didn't, mm -hmm. the structure of it was. Uh, and, okay, so according to your notes, you were um, released from duty in early 46. Yeah. I believe it was in February. Uh, yeah. And where were you uh, discharged? Uh, Fort Devens. So close to home. Yeah. Well, I, I went in at Fort Devens, mm -hmm. came out at Fort Devens. And what happened afterward? Well, what happened afterward is I, I, I got in the GI Bill mm -hmm. and uh, went back to Worcester Poly and mm -hmm. they said, you know, uh, you got credits for the work you did at, at Brooklyn Poly and we will skip a year. So I was out of there. I, I, I got out in 40, 45, and I was out of there in 47. Mm -hmm. And was that a bachelor's? Yeah, yes. bachelor's. In electrical engineering? Or? Uh, electrical engineering. Okay. And then what happened? Well, there you have it. Uh -huh. You have. Uh, uh, right here. You, you have it there. Okay. In terms of, I, I then went to work for Raytheon. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically uh, started as a work in, in what we call circuits mm -hmm. for about a year. And uh, then they said, you're going to become a plumber. A plumber. A plumber meant you work in microwave, you work with waveguides. Uh huh. Uh, this is where you get involved with, uh, I don't know, Maxwell's equations and the the, the, the electromagnetic mm -hmm. uh, theory is used. But you you end up uh, working on um, the front end of radars where uh -huh. where, where you have uh, the energy from the transmitter sent through waveguide to antennas and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so that I, I um, uh, You got to work I on did, I did that in, in, and uh, I worked for a while with a, with a, with a group mm -hmm. uh, and basically I said to my boss, I'm going to, I'm going to leave, I'm going. He says, you're not going. He said, uh, there is a managerial position in the missile division. Okay. So I went to the missile division and uh, it was an interesting experience because I came from a group that was very organized and structured mm -hmm. to one that was unstructured, somewhat disorganized, and they were at the forefront of missile development. <clears throat> And things they were doing really hadn't been done before. And so that these, these characters were really wild and woolly people. Uh, I, I uh, remember sitting with a number of the managers and uh, I had been there a couple of weeks and I saw what they were doing and how can you put something into production where you have to diddle things. I mean, you've got to design it so you can make it mm -hmm. like like you, you would a, a car, so mm -hmm. you don't have to. And one of the managers, I remember, I will forget, we were sitting at the table at lunch, he picked up his arm and slammed it on the table and said to me, you put up a shut up. Okay. okay. I put up and he and I, we got along very well afterward. And that was an interesting experience because uh, I was involved with it's very high pressure mm -hmm. in terms of uh, getting things out for missile shoots. Things, things had to get out and uh, they had to work and so forth. And uh, so it was a, an interesting time and uh, 
basically, uh, some of the experiences uh, were interesting because there were certain problems I solved where, where uh, there were, I don't know how to put it, but where one problem where the head of the division came and they were, they were, had a major problem, it got solved, I happened to solve it. And he, he ran into my office and he hugged me and kissed me on both cheeks. <laughs> this was, this is, he, he, he became CEO of the company, whatever. But we developed a good relationship in terms of um, that aspect to him. And after a while, in this job, I uh, began to get bored. I said, this is now, this is now repetition. And uh, so I, I went to the gentleman, and um, I uh, said, you know, Tom, I'm, I really want to change here. What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. So I said, well, there's interesting uh, techniques, new, new techniques, new, uh, in terms of low noise microwave amplifiers, and I think that this is some area we go into. So he said to me, well, what do you need? I said, well, maybe 70,000, and uh, we, we could have something in a reasonably short period of time. And he said, okay. So within about four or five months, I had a small group, and we developed this amplifier, mm -hmm. and it helped him win a, a very large contract in terms of a, a radar system, because this was a, a low noise amplifier, and the amount of transmitter power he would need was small, so he was mm -hmm. very competitive. So then he came to me and said, what else you want to do? So, so I said, well, uh, how about getting involved in laser development? And, and, and this was very early in, in, the, in the game because Hughes had, had just developed the laser. And, um, and the thing I liked was almost bringing together people and, and getting ideas and having work together. So we came up with a system. And so I had an idea of translating what we were doing in the microwave end into the laser wavelength in what we call Doppler, mm -hmm. Doppler systems. And so that, is that me? No, that was outside. Doppler systems. So basically, uh, there was a request for a proposal that mm -hmm. we got from the Air Force. And so that I thought of the idea of using Doppler type systems. And uh, basically, had done a little bit of work showing the feasibility of it. Mm -hmm and came up, formed the group, and we put together a system where I had people from our research division, and I was in missile division, and other divisions where we have a total unit, total mm -hmm. system. And we bid this and uh, won it. And I think it was like maybe three quarters of a million bucks at that time. And <laughs> <laughs> and uh, could you just kind of uh, pinpoint what uh, are we talking? Nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties, seventies. This is this is getting into the late sixties. Okay. So three quarters of a million bucks was three quarters yeah, yeah, of a yeah, million yeah, bucks. Yeah, yeah, it was three quarters of a million bucks. And, <laughs> and Tom comes to me and says, "How the heck did you do this?" He says, "They they in use." invented the laser. I said, we had a better idea mm -hmm. in terms of doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, it was an interesting project. And um, it led to other, other things. Uh, the way the mind works, it, 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 it led to other things. That is, we were basically proposing this Doppler system and the question became, uh, how can you test it? And it was for a space intercept system. Right. 
used in space where you want to intercept incoming missiles. But how do you test that on Earth? Because you're now dealing with lasers, and how is atmospheric turbulence going to affect your signals? Uh -huh. It's like we, when you look up at the sky at mm -hmm. stars, they twinkle. Right. Because there's atmospheric turbulence. So it said, okay, um, we got to run experiments and check out what we can do in terms of turbulence because we want to test the system on Earth. It can't be go to space and so forth. So that got us into a totally different area right. uh -huh. of, of uh, measuring turbulence, of which, uh, uh, again, a separate group of, of people, and uh, it took us out to New Mexico to various to, to an uh, uh, just outside of, let's see, White Sands, mm -hmm. place called Cloudcroft. It's a uh, observatory there and where we, we set up, made a setup and stopped measuring turbulence mm -hmm. and really made some of the first measurements in the world of turbulence with lasers and published papers and so forth. And what it indicated is that Yes, you, you can do it, but the wavelengths of the lasers have to be different right. in terms of it. Mm -hmm. and, and fortunately, our research division had developed lasers at different wavelengths and so mm -hmm. forth. So that project was interesting because it went on on its own, and then I got uh, involved with, as that was going on, with other things at the mm -hmm. same time, where we were talking about uh, the measurement of clear air turbulence that you'd have in front of an aircraft, for example, mm -hmm. the problem of turbulence there. And that was interesting because uh, at that time there was lots of communication, lots of communication between what you thought were competitors, because I was dealing with Bell Labs, I was de de dealing with um, Lincoln Laboratory and so forth, particularly with Lincoln Lab because we were in the competition in a sense of, of who was going to get a certain w a laser first. It was, the, it was called a CO2 laser, 10.6 microns a laser. The, the, and um, the people at Lincoln got the laser before we did by about two weeks. And I, I talked to the fellow Bob Kingston and I said to Bob, gee, you know, you beat us in terms of getting there. I said, you've been testing it. What do you find? He says, Herb, it's kind of peculiar. He says, I shine it up into the sky, and there's scatter coming back. There's stuff coming back. And that's what we were looking for. We were looking for ways of getting clear air turbulence uh -huh. detection. Because if, some, if something's coming back from the particles mm -hmm. in the air, you can then have a, a target at which you could you could determine and so forth. <laughs> so. Once I learned that, we set up a wind tunnel, and I guess the guys we worked all night, and we did get signals. Mm -hmm. And we were able to write a proposal and get some work from the Air Force, mm -hmm. and got involved with the whole area of, of clear <laughs> turbulence detection from, from that. The other work, this, the, the, I call it the space intercept right. radar. Mm -hmm. But the space intercept radar was interesting because uh, to go back, we, we came up with a, a whole system, and at that time, the laser was considered high-powered lasers, very dangerous, they mm. still are. So they said to us, you know, we have to test the system, and the only place, this is now the, the space system, mm -hmm. the only place we're going to give you is the old Trinity site at White Sands where the first bomb went off. Oh boy! Yeah, so they took they, they they said this is where you're going to be, and I went out with one of my engineers and we surveyed the place from the base um, center of of, of uh, White Sands. It's about 75 miles up the range, and it's devastation. And you get to this area, and you, you, it's it's mind-boggling because it's like a bowl that's surrounded by mountains. Uh -huh. And it's it's sort of curved, but there are roads 
that all fit in, and as you drive in, there was this wreckage still there of the original tower. Wow. At that time. It's been removed now. Mm -hmm. There's a monument there. And um, they said, this is where you're going to be. And I said, safe? They said, yeah, there's stuff called Trinitite that, that uh, is there, no longer radioactive and so uh -huh. forth. He said, it's a safe place and so forth. So the, the, the guys I had set up their equipments there, trailers and their targets and whatever. And within <laughs> a couple of weeks, they, they said, sent me be back uh, notice that they needed weapons because they had trouble with snakes. <laughs> because oh, they set up trailers mm -hmm. and there were shadows uh -huh. and the snakes liked the shadows. The, the, the sidewinders and mm -hmm. rattlers liked the oh yeah, so oh yeah, we had a lot in this work I had a lot to do with nature. Bears and mm -hmm. snakes and whatever. But any anyway, we assigned them that and they would send me pictures of the the snakes that they were they, they had shot. Anyway, uh, that's an interesting sidelight, and in terms of that uh, that experience and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, it was interesting because I I uh, having been involved in that work, I had differences of opinion with some of the management that I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. And basically, I said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in what's called the space division. They moved. Uh, what happened is that they separated some of us from the missile division into a space division. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, I, I, I want to then go back to the missile division. Mm -hmm. And that got me back to different technology more what's called passive infrared technology, where you're basically uh, no longer using lasers in a mm -hmm. sense, but now are looking at backgrounds and what you can determine, yeah. uh, particularly aircraft mm -hmm. against different backgrounds. Okay. And that began to involve uh, uh, some interesting <laughs> physics because there were the major, all the major systems that that our division had, the missile division, and unfortunately I can't get into too much, but there were certain weak spots. Mm -hmm. There were certain blind spots where the radar could not pick up the targets. Mm -hmm. And there were really lots of critical information, a lot of it coming from Israel, that at that time, I don't know the, 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 the Egyptian war, whatever, but the uh, Israelis were not able to detect airplanes coming in. They would come in and they would be suddenly not, re not recognized. And I remember puzzling the problem and uh, coming up with, and I can't get into too much detail, but a solution to that particular problem. Right. And basically, I remember presenting it to our management in the missile division, and the head of the division said, uh, uh, this is worth, I didn't think we could solve the problem. It was a mm -hmm. physics problem, and you had to look at it a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. So uh, that started me into, into looking at interesting technology really beginning to bring the computer in mm -hmm. and bringing in in the area of more engineering uh, as I knew it uh, from the way the people in the infrared area which are mostly physicists thought they didn't think in terms of systems and uh, digitizing, I mean, what we have now, what we consider nothing now at that time, back 25 years ago, was a little different mm -hmm. in terms of doing it. And fortunately, I had a pretty good eye for picking talent in, in, in terms of particular people, because I found that I, I couldn't solve the problems, but I mm -hmm. knew 
who, who, who had the capability of doing it. And it was almost like, I was saying to my wife, it's almost like being an orchestra leader mm -hmm. in the sense of uh, you, you, you're conducting an orchestra where you, you can bring in the violins and you can bring in the, right. the, the, the different parts and they okay. can, you play the tune, you can play the, mm -hmm. the music. If we could step away from Raytheon for just a moment, uh, did you join any veterans organizations such as the American Legion? No, I, 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 ne I never, uh, no, the, the, the military I kept away from and okay. memories of, I mean, what you're bringing out is stuff that I would have been passed away with me. I mean, I, right. I really... Uh, I, and um, did you um, ever keep stay in contact with the? We did. I did early in the game with uh -huh. some of the people who were in the group, and then we lost contact mm -hmm. in terms of it, actually. Okay. So overall, you were at Raytheon for over four, about forty-one years. Yeah. Yeah. And when did you retire? Uh, Nineteen eighty-eight. Okay. And uh, according to your notes, your not only retired from Raytheon, but you were a docent for the Worcester Art Museum. Oh yeah, yeah, I was a docent at the Worcester Art Museum, and uh, uh -huh. then there I, I, for some reason or another, no, I said to my wife, I retired in 1988, uh -huh. I said to my wife, you know, uh, let me try something in art, and I said, what? She says, I, I said, she said, what? I said, sculpting. Uh -huh. I tried it, and they said, you know, you're, you're, you're natural. Really? Yeah, they, they said, you can't, um, we can't teach you mm -hmm. portraiture. I mean, in figures, one thing, but for portraiture, we can't teach you that. You're oh. born with it. So I said, okay. So I pushed the envelope mm -hmm. and got accepted uh, to the BU School of Fine Art. I went there for six years. Really? Working with the kids. Uh -huh. And it was good work with okay. the kids because they'd come in and they'd say, Irf, can we put on this CD? And I said, all right. I said, uh, I said, what are they singing? Well, you know, it's rap. I said, but what, what, what are they singing? You don't want to know. <laughs> and that was a good experience. Yeah. I, I would uh, commute from Sudbury to there. Uh, I used the MTA or whatever. Mm -hmm. And after six years, I said, uh, it was uh, interesting. But at the same time, I was taking courses in art history because mm -hmm. as a docent, I was required to keep up with, with art mm -hmm. history. I, I really enjoyed uh, taking the people on tours and, mm -hmm. and uh, lecturing on that stuff, so. And also you, um, you say that you're also a collector and repairer of antique watches. Yeah, I, yeah. How'd you well, get into that? Well, I got into that when I first started at Raytheon, my boss named Bill Pritchard, mm -hmm. and Bill passed on and he and his wife, though, were really, she was a historian of watches, and she wrote books, and he, was, he loved to do repair. And I remember I was in his group, and he said to me, Irv, he says, would you like to learn how to repair watches? And I said, I don't know why he picked me out, but, but he, some reason or other. And so I uh, started, and then there was another gentleman, the name was, um, Oh boy, Fritz Gross. Mm -hmm. uh, Fritz became vice president of Raytheon, but I got to know Fritz because he was also repairing. And so um, these two guys, gentlemen, were pretty good with their hands. I was a little more klutzy, but I, I got pretty good. Then in the travels, uh, traveling quite a bit, I uh, spent time in different cities, Europe and the US, and I said, you know, let me, go in antique shops and so forth. And it was interesting because you could be in Germany and you go in and then you're communicating with someone because mm -hmm. you're dealing with an object that you both know. So as a consequence, I began collecting things. Mm -hmm. And I'm at a process of life now where I'm decollecting things. Ah. Mm -hmm. Now, as um, did your were your children or grandchildren ever interested in the military? Did they? No. No? Okay. No. No. Uh, is there anything you want to say to those who are going to be watching this? Uh, any general comments about the military? Did, did yeah, you I think in terms of the military, uh, I, I would say 
if you can, go to what you're interested in, mm -hmm. your strong points, in terms of it. Mm -hmm. I would say, if, if, if you're fortunate enough to do that, mm -hmm. and I found myself fortunate mm -hmm. to be able to do that with some luck because mm -hmm. of, of the way people got divided at the time. Some went to the infantry, and these people were, were uh, went to, they were involved with the Battle of the Bulge and so forth. Mm -hmm. I've kept contact with, with some of them, but basically, uh, uh, it's uh, made commentary now about the military. Uh, you know, I, I, I watch various news reports and, and the, the people that are, the ones that are, where you have these fatalities and so forth, it's, it's heartbreaking in mm -hmm. terms of the, the young people, mm -hmm. in terms of th that aspect of it. And so many of them go in because the future there in terms of education mm -hmm. and so forth, so that it's, uh, and I think now, with the, they, I think there would be this passage of some sort of GI Bill, mm -hmm. you know, is long mm -hmm. overdue. Mm -hmm. Irving, is there anything else you'd like to say? I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm a, a little uh, in awe of, of mm -hmm. this whole procedure here in terms <laughs> of uh, what is kind of resurrected in my mind, mm -hmm. and having realized that I, I never did realize that I lived through something so historic mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, it was something we lived through till I till I researched it and realized mm -hmm. who was on this ship and what it all kind of meant. Mm -hmm. Because there's some I began to realize there's certain different museums in Australia and so forth with pictures of. Of all these people and the ship, mm -hmm. uh, just at the time I was on it, it's, and it's like historic uh, event, or whatever. But right. Anyway, uh, it's nice to live long enough to realize. <laughs> <laughs> to realize it. Well, not just to be at that particular moment, but just to be part of the next generation of. Uh, yeah. What, yeah, with the yeah. missiles and what have yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, it's 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 uh, now you know even at my age I have interest in what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. in the politics and and, and so forth. And uh, I take many courses. My wife and I take many courses and so forth. And um, I found that in the work I had done, there was lots of travel, mm -hmm. and to the point where. Uh, it doesn't really intrigue intrigue us, so we do what we call travels of the mind. It's right. more of the courses and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's a okay. well, Irving Goldstein. I thank you so much for coming in and telling your story for the Veterans Oral History Project. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>